Now back where I live in Berrien Springs, there are eight inches of snow in my front yard. <laughs> Coming here to California is a relief for many reasons. <laughs> Pastor Don spoke of a number of available materials dealing with this subject, including the handouts connected directly with this seminar. Let me also direct uh, those of you who are present here in this meeting, as well as those that are watching by different means, to the website advindicate.com, where there are two articles on this subject to which I would direct your attention. One of them is by me, and it is titled, Three Co-Eternal Persons, just like our seminar this weekend. Another one is by one of the other leaders of our website, uh, Brother Lemuel Sapien, who reviews the history of the Trinitarian doctrine in early Adventism. And for those of you who might be interested in how the pioneers of our movement came to some of the conclusions they arrived at, uh, this article, I believe, will be invaluable to your study. Well, our topic this morning for our first meeting is From Everlasting. At this time of year especially, we often think of the Old Testament prophecy that foretold the small village in Judea where Christ would be born. Micah chapter 5 verse 2, of course we remember it very well. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. It is from this passage that I have drawn the title of this first message this morning. The same point is underscored in the following passage from the Gospel of John. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 and 14. <clears throat> in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All, um, and the Word was made what? flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth so the word that became flesh was not only with God that word was God now some claim that the word begotten when it is used relative to Jesus status as the son of God proves that at some point in eternity past, He was brought forth as a separate being from the Father. But like many words found in the inspired writings, the word begotten, or in Greek, monogenes, and I don't generally like to get into the ancient languages in a seminar like this because um, we're not dealing with a strictly theological gathering. I remember one speaker saying many years ago, Jesus always spoke in language that the boys and girls could understand. And when he instructed his disciples, he said, Feed my sheep, not my giraffes. <laughs> well, uh, that's the reason why I generally don't like to get too technical in meetings like this. But it's interesting what Ellen White says about the use of inspired language. Listen to this statement found in Volume 1 of Selected Messages, page 20. Different meanings are expressed by the same word. There is not one word for each distinct idea. For example, when you find uh, the word atonement used in the writings of Ellen White, sometimes it refers strictly to the sacrifice that Jesus offered on Calvary. At other times it refers to the total process of salvation including the ministry of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. And if you read the Bible, the, the, the process of atonement does not finish until the scapegoat is destroyed. Because in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 10, the scapegoat makes atonement. And how does it do that? Because only when the originator of evil is destroyed can Eden lost at last become Eden restored. So the fact is that the word begotten as used in the New Testament carries the primary meaning not of origination but of preeminence 
and uniqueness. Probably the strongest verse on this point is, is uh, not Isaiah, but Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. Here we read, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promise offered up his only begotten son. That's exactly the same construct we find in John 3.16 where God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Now, was Isaac at the time he, offered, or, uh, he was offered by Abraham on Mount Moriah, was he Abraham's only biological son? No. By this time, Abraham had already fathered who? Ishmael, that's right. Let's look at what we find here in Genesis chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. And Hagar bare Abram a son, and Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bore Ishmael. And Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. So Abraham was 86 years old when he became the father of Ishmael. How old was Abraham when he became the father of Isaac? Well, let's, let's find out what the Bible says, shall we? Genesis chapter 21, verse 5, And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. So Ishmael had definitely been born before Isaac, which means Isaac was not Abraham's only biological son at the time he was sacrificed on Mount Moriah. But, Abraham, but Isaac, rather, was Abraham's only unique son, his only preeminent son. That's what the word begotten means, especially when it is applied in the Bible to Jesus. Now, some have directed our attention to Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, which is clearly a messianic psalm, by the way, in which God the Father says to His Son, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten Thee. Now, the assumption is made by certain anti-Trinitarians that this means that at some point in eternity past, Jesus was brought forth as a separate being from God the Father. But when the New Testament cites this verse in the words of the Apostle Paul, this verse is applied to Jesus' resurrection, not to some point in distant eternity past. Let's turn to Acts chapter 13, verses 32 and 33. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that He hath raised up Jesus again, as it is written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Folks, there is no inspired statement anywhere in either the Bible or the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy that applies this verse from the second psalm to a point in eternity past at which Jesus was supposedly brought forth from the Father as a separate being. Anti-Trinitarians have also called our attention to the 8th chapter of Proverbs, which the inspired evidence also indicates is a reference to Jesus the personification of wisdom. The following verses have especially been the focus of attention. Let's look at them. Verses 23 through 25 in Proverbs chapter 8. I was set up, this is Jesus talking here, from everlasting, there's that phrase again, from the beginning or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no foundations abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. Now the assumption is made regarding these verses that the phrase brought forth means to have a have no to, to, that means not rather to have had a prior separate existence. Okay? First of all, let's see how the phrase from everlasting in verse 23 is as clear as it can be that the one speaking had no beginning. 
This is the same phrase, obviously, that we find in Micah 5, 2, regarding the Savior to be born in Bethlehem. Remember what it said, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Now, it's, it seems pretty clear, folks, that if Jesus was set up from everlasting, that means He's always been there. It doesn't mean that at some point He had a beginning. What is more, when we look at this phrase, brought forth, as it is used elsewhere in the Old Testament, it becomes impossible to understand it as implying the absence of a separate prior existence. Let's look at, for example, Genesis chapter 15, where God is inviting Abraham to come out of his tent and count the stars. Genesis chapter 15, verse 5, And he, that is God, brought him forth. That's the same phrase we find in, in Proverbs 8. Brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars. Now, obviously, Abraham was in existence as an individual being before God called him out of his tent, wasn't he? Obviously, he, did, he didn't begin a separate existence when he came out at the command of the Lord. Now, let's look at some passages where the children of Israel are described as having been brought forth out of Egypt. There are a number of them. Exodus chapter 29, verse 46 and they shall know that I am the Lord their God that brought them up out of the land of Egypt. Leviticus chapter 25 verse 38 tells us, I am the Lord your God which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt. Now the children of Israel had already existed as, as a separate people while they were in the land of Egypt. So it isn't correct to assume that being brought forth necessarily implies the start of a separate existence because they already had a separate existence. Now here's another verse. This one from the story of Jeremiah's imprisonment by Pashur. Remember the temple governor who had opposed and persecuted him and one night uh, decided to put him in the stocks. Remember what we find here in Jeremiah chapter 20. Many of us remember this story. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 3, it says, And it came to pass on the morrow that Pashur brought forth Jeremiah out of the stocks. Now once again, Jeremiah had a distinct and individual existence while he was in the stocks. He didn't get a separate existence once he was brought out of the stocks. Okay? So when we look at this phrase as it is used throughout the Old Testament, it becomes clear that when Jesus applies it to himself in Proverbs chapter 8, he is simply describing his being brought forth by the Father for a specific purpose. In this case, as described in verses 23 to 25, for his work of creation. I didn't include this statement here. I probably should have, but in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 36, Ellen White says that Jesus was ever at the right hand of the Father. Forever, she says. Not just when He began the work of creation, but He was brought forth specifically when it was time for the work of, of creating the universe to commence. The Bible is clear that Jesus is the one through whom the Father created all of the worlds and all of the galaxies and all of what constitutes the universe as we know it. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by Him, that is Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. The book of Hebrews tells us the same thing. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It seems that once again I need to remember that putting these texts on slides, I can't just try to crowd everything on them because they get lost, I notice. <laughs> God, who at sundry, sundry times and diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made, what? The worlds. Not just this world, but all the worlds. 
But the fact that the Father worked through His Son and through the Holy Spirit, as we're going to see, to create the universe doesn't mean all three of these divine beings were not and are not co-eternal. We're going to talk in a moment about the different roles within the Godhead, but for now we must establish the eternal pre-existence of Jesus Christ on the basis of what we have seen in the inspired writings and what we're going to see as a being distinct and separate from the Father. All of us remember Jesus' statement to the unbelieving Jews in John chapter 8. We know the story. Remember Jesus is rebuking the Jews that didn't believe in Him. And at one point, one of them says, Look, you aren't yet 50 years old and you claim to have seen Abraham. And Jesus responded, Before Abraham was, I am. Now, Ellen White describes the reaction of those present when Jesus made this statement. Desire of Ages, pages 469 and 470. Silence fell upon the vast assembly. The name of God, given by Moses to express the idea of the eternal presence, had been claimed as His own by this Galilean rabbi. He had announced Himself to be the self-existent one. He who had been promised to Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from the days of what? Eternity. The Jews listening to Jesus obviously knew what he meant by this statement. He was claiming, in simple words, to be God. The great I Am who had spoken to Moses at the burning bush in the wilderness. Exodus chapter 3, we know the story. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. This is why the Bible says that when Jesus made this claim, what did the Jews try to do? <laughs> yes, verse 58 of John chapter 8, Then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Look, folks, they knew he was claiming to be God. No wonder they wanted to stone him because they didn't believe he was God. But they knew what he was claiming. Another Ellen White statement clearly identifies Jesus as the I Am of the Old Testament. Manuscript 15, 1894. Who is the I Am? Jesus Christ, who was in the pillar of cloud. Elsewhere, she again identifies Jesus as the self-existent God. Volume 7 of the Bible Commentary, page 955. It was the source of all mercy and pardon, peace and grace, the self-existent, eternal, unchangeable one who visited his exiled servant on the isle that is called Patmos. That sounds pretty clear, isn't it? Evangelism, page 615. He, that is Christ, was equal with God, infinite and omnipotent. Folks, if He's infinite, that means He never had a beginning. Infinite and omnipotent. He is the eternal, self-existent Son. In other statements, the servant of the Lord is clear that Jesus is the Jehovah of the Old Testament. Listen to this statement here from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 305. We're going to establish who Jehovah was, and now we're going to, then we're going to see how Jehovah is identified. Jehovah, the eternal, self-existent, uncreated one, himself the source and sustainer of all, is alone entitled to supreme reverence and worship. You know, by the way, that's the reason why we know, for example, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah 
and his wife and announced the birth of Samson. Remember what they did as when they offered that sacrifice? They fell on their faces to the ground. Now, if that had just been an angel, what would he have told them? Don't do that. Remember in the, in the book of Revelation? Twice John bowed before the angel, and the angel says, Don't do that. That's only for God. Remember, this is another uh, piece of evidence, by the way, that the being that appeared in the cave of the witch of Endor to King Saul was not a heavenly being as many evangelical Christians believe. They believe that Samuel was up in heaven and that God sent him to the cave of the witch to tell Saul that he was going to die the next day. But folks, remember what happened? Saul bowed to the ground when that being appeared. The devil doesn't mind that we worship him. But an angel of God, a heavenly being, would have said, No, don't do that. Only God is worthy of worship. Let's go on. Loma Linda Messages, page 319. Jehovah is the true God. Let Him be feared and reverenced. Well, the anti-Trinitarians among us call themselves the One True God Movement. Ellen White identifies Jehovah as the one true God in the statements that we've just read, doesn't she? But now listen to this other statement. Signs of the Times, May 3, 1899. Jehovah is the name given to who? To Christ. Behold, God is my salvation, writes the prophet Isaiah. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength, and my song. But, let's be clear, Jehovah is also the Father. Manuscript 11, 1898. Listen to what the servant of the Lord says here. Jehovah, our Father, and His Son Jesus Christ are alone to be exalted. The knowledge of God is eternal life to those who receive it. His holy banner is to stand above all the greatness of the greatest men, above all the honor and the glory of the world. So according to the inspired pen, the Jehovah of the Old Testament is in fact both God the Father and God the Son. Remember what we said last evening about the false either-or dilemmas that many of the non-Trinitarians are raising. What we see here regarding this and other issues involving the Trinity, which we're going to be considering, is not a question of either or, but rather of both and. God the Father and God the Son are Jehovah. Jehovah is not simply one or the other. Other Ellen White statements are equally clear regarding the Savior's eternal pre-existence. Signs of the Times, May 3, 1899, same statement we quoted, or the same source from which we quoted the, uh, an earlier statement. Here Christ shows that although they might reckon His life to be less than 50 years, yet His divine life could not be reckoned by human computation. The existence of Christ before His incarnation is not measured by figures. In other words, folks, He's always been there. Here are some other statements. We saw this one last evening. Volume 5 of the Bible Commentary, page 1136. Not one of the angels could become surety for the human race. Their life is God's. They could not surrender it. The angels all wear the yoke of obedience. They are the appointed messengers of Him who is the commander of all heaven. But Christ is equal with God infinite and omnipotent. There's that word infinite again. He could pay the ransom for man's freedom. He is the eternal self-existing Son on whom no yoke had come. And when God asked, Whom shall I send? He could reply, Here am I, send me. He could pledge Himself to become man's surety for he could say that which the highest angel could not say. I have power over my own life, power to lay it down, and power 
to take it up again. Now we're going to speak further about this point when we consider who in fact raised Jesus from the dead. Because that's a point of contention now among some of the non-Trinitarians. But let's go on. Desire of Ages, page 19. From the days of eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ was one with the Father. He was the image of God, the image of His greatness and majesty, the outshining of His glory. Acts of the Apostles, pages 38 and 39. When Christ passed within the heavenly gates, He was enthroned amidst the adoration of the angels. As soon as the ceremony was completed, the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples in rich currents. And Christ was indeed glorified even with the glory which He had with the Father from where? From all eternity. That doesn't sound like He had a beginning point, does it? In speaking of His pre-existence, Christ carries the mind back through dateless ages. He assures us that there never was a time when He was not in close fellowship with the eternal God. Volume 1 of Selected Messages, page 220. Here we go again, folks. From all eternity Christ was united with the Father, and when He took upon Himself human nature, He was still one with God. And for those who might still attempt to read the above statements as affirming Christ's eternal pre-existence with the Father, but not as a separate person, the following statements are perhaps the clearest of all. One Selected Messages, page 247. The Word existed as a divine being, even as the eternal Son of God, in union and oneness with His Father. From everlasting, He was the mediator of the covenant. The one in whom all nations of the earth, both Jews and Gentiles, if they accepted Him, were to be blessed. And by the way, that helps us understand that from the very beginning of the sacred period, from the very beginning of the plan of salvation, God's redemption was extended to the entire world. Something that helps us wonder, or causes us to wonder rather, why there was all this controversy in the early church about whether God should show mercy to the Gentiles. One wonders why the Jews, who were awaiting the Messiah, were not aware of how the entire world was to be blessed by the Messiah's grace. Christ was God essentially and in the highest sense. He was with God from all eternity, God over all, blessed forevermore. Now listen, this is about as clear as it can get. The Lord Jesus Christ, the divine Son of God, existed from eternity, a distinct person, yet one with the Father. Youth's Instructor, December 16, 1897. Folks, we've got the answers here from the inspired pen. We just need to go looking for them. Last evening, I pointed out, we should not be afraid of controversy. We should not be afraid of these issues being raised because God in advance has given us the answers. Youth's Instructor, December 16, 1897. From eternity, there was a complete unity between the Father and the Son. They were two, yet little short of being identical. Two in individuality. Think of that. Yet one in spirit and heart and character. And then, of course, we have this inspired declaration. Most of us, I'm sure, are familiar with this one. From Desire of Ages, page 530. In Christ is life original, unborrowed, and underived. This statement leaves no room for the belief that Christ at some point in the dim dark reaches of eternity was brought forth from His Father. Or that the Father was the original source from which the Son proceeded. Now, some have even compared 
Jesus' alleged derivation from the Father to the stone cut without hands in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Such language, folks, as unborrowed and underived flatly rules out such a notion. Yes, Jesus did come from the Father at His incarnation, as we find in John chapter 16, verse 20. But at no point in eternity past did He originate or derive life, power, or wisdom from His Father. The inspired pen is clear, as we have seen, that the Son has not only existed from eternity, but that He has existed as a distinct, fully divine person from eternity. He was never brought forth from one form into another. Let's also be clear that simply because the inspired writings describe Him as being one with the Father, that this in no way implies that He and the, fa and the, the, that he and the Father were not two distinct persons. A husband and a wife are one. Are they not? But they're still two distinct individuals. At least I hope they are. <laughs> the same is true with the members of the Godhead. Now, Ellen White reinforces her conviction that Jesus is the Jehovah or Yahweh of the Old Testament in such statements as Desire of Ages, page 70. This is referring, of course, to Jesus' upbringing as a child. And the servant of the Lord says, the very words which he himself had spoken to Moses for Israel, he was now taught at his mother's knee. He who had made all things. Who are we talking about here? He who had made all things studied the lessons which his own hand had written in earth and sea and sky. There are those who say that if Jesus was co-eternal with the Father as a distinct divine being, He wouldn't be the Son of God, but rather He would be God's associate. Well, interestingly, Ellen White uses the very word associate to describe Jesus' relationship to His Father. Listen to what we find here in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 34. The Sovereign of the universe was not alone in His work of beneficence, he had a what? An associate, a co-worker who could appreciate his purposes and could share his joy in giving happiness to created beings. It is being alleged by some in the non-Trinitarian camp that Jesus Christ is not the Lord God Almighty, the one we've been singing about during these services. One particular Ellen White statement is being used to support this claim. Now, we're going to look at this statement. Once again, folks, remember the principle that we have established. We solve these controversies by comparing inspired statements with each other. Inspiration is its own interpreter. So we're going to look at this statement that is commonly being used just now by certain of the non-Trinitarians, and then we're going to compare it to another that uses similar language. Lift him up, page 235. There is no one who can explain the mystery of the incarnation of Christ, yet we know that He came to this earth and lived as a man among men. The man Jesus Christ was not the Lord God Almighty, yet Christ and the Father are one. The deity did not sink under the agonizing torture of Calvary, yet it is nonetheless true that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now clearly this is speaking of Christ when? During the incarnation. At which time the Bible says He took, according to Philippians chapter 2 verse 7, the form of a servant. Ellen White is clear that Jesus had laid down His almighty power before He came to this earth. Speaking of His experience in Peter's boat during the storm on Galilee, this is what Ellen White says. Desire of Ages, page 336. But He rested not in the possession of almighty power. It was not as the master of earth and sea and sky that He reposed in quiet. That power He had what? He laid down, and he says, I can of mine own self do nothing. 
He trusted in the Father's might. It was in faith, faith in God's love and care that Jesus rested. And the power of that word which stilled the storm was the power of God. There's another Ellen White statement where she says that the miracles of Christ were performed by the heavenly angels. Consider this, folks. Listen carefully. If Jesus had laid down almighty power when he became human, that means he had it before. Another statement which describes Jesus in his glorified state in heaven declares that he is very definitely the Lord God Almighty. Councils to Teachers, page 402. The crowning glory of Christ's attributes is His holiness. The angels bow before Him in adoration, exclaiming, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. He is declared to be glorious in His holiness. Study the character of God by beholding Christ by seeking Him in faith and prayer, you may become like Him. Elsewhere, she says the same thing. In Signs of the Times, December 30, 1889, elevate the cross of Christ. Elevate the Mediator. Lift up Jesus. In Him is everything noble. Contemplate God in Christ. He is surrounded with angels, Cherubim and seraphim continually behold him. Angelic voices day and night cry before him, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Here's another one. Testimonies to Ministers, page 3, 432. These heavenly beings, angels that is, in executing the mandate of God, ask no questions, but do as they are bid. Jehovah of hosts, the Lord God Almighty, the just, the true, and the holy, has given them their work to do. And who in fact is Jehovah? According to the inspired evidence we've seen already, Jehovah is the name given to Christ. So when Ellen White says in the statement we saw earlier from Lift Him Up, page 235, that the man Jesus Christ was not the Lord God Almighty, she is speaking of the man Jesus during His incarnation, not the co-eternal second person of the Godhead. This is similar to Jesus' statement during His incarnation in John the 14th chapter, verse 28, where He says, My Father is greater than I. This is a description of Jesus' relationship to His Father while He lived as a man on this earth. It does not imply that Jesus was not and is not co-eternal with His Father. Now, I want us to consider for a moment the question of who in fact raised Jesus from the dead. Because this is becoming a point of controversy so far as this issue of the Godhead is concerned. It is being claimed that God the Father raised Jesus from the dead, that Jesus did not raise Himself from the dead. Well, based on the inspired evidence, it is clear that both the Father and the Son, once again, were involved in Jesus' resurrection. This is another one of those false either-or dilemmas that we've been talking about. Jesus st stated very clearly in the Gospel of John, which was quoted earlier in an Ellen White statement that we saw, John chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it up again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. So as usual, Ellen White echoes the Bible when she states in Desire of Ages, page 785, When the voice of the mighty angel was heard at Christ's tomb, saying, Thy Father calls thee, the Savior came forth from the grave by the life that was where? In himself. Let's look at Upward Look, page 144. 
To Moses, Jehovah declared, I am that I am. Christ declared before Abraham was, I am. By this declaration, he laid open the resources of his infinite nature, imparting in his words assurance of pardon for the guilty race. He is the word, conscious of power, that he can take up and lay down his life as he chooses in order to secure the salvation of those who have fallen under Satan's falsehoods and intrigues. So it was both the Father and the Son, according to the inspired pen, who raised Jesus from the dead. Now I want us to focus on the issue of different roles within the Godhead and the relationship of this issue to the question of gender authority in spiritual leadership on earth. Remember last evening I spoke about that issue in passing and now we're going to see how that issue is related to the issue that we are addressing here this weekend. It is imperative that those of us who adhere to the biblical position on gender role distinctions in the home and in the church not permit our position to be wrongly associated with an anti-Trinitarian view of the Godhead. There are those who are stating, those among the anti-Trinitarians, are stating that just as Eve came out of Adam, so Jesus supposedly came out of the Father. But that is not what the inspired writings teach. The Apostle Paul is clear in comparing the, the spiritual relationship of male and female with the relationship of God the Father to His Son, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, many of us are familiar with this passage. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. While Scripture describes the Father and the Son as equal, in a number of passages, and we've seen a number of Ellen White statements that say the same thing, the submission of the Son to the Father is clear from before the beginning of creation. The Father is declared to have created all things through His Son. You know, we don't read that the Son creates things through the Father. It's the Father who does things through the Son. It is the Father who has chosen us in Him, that is Christ, before the foundation of the world, it is the Father who has predestined us to be conformed to the image of His Son. It is the Father who sends the Son into the world to make possible humanity's salvation. Before returning from earth to His Father in heaven, Christ declared in Matthew the 28th chapter, verse 18, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. This power is obviously given to Jesus by His Father on account of Jesus' triumph on earth over sin and death. The seating of Christ at His Father's right hand following Christ's ascension is also indicative of the Father's supreme authority. To be seated at the right hand of an ancient monarch in the ancient world meant that one, the one thus honored was second in authority. We see this clarified elsewhere in Jesus' declaration. In John the 5th chapter, verse 22, The Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Now if this authority is committed to the Son by the Father, the ultimate authority is in fact the Father's. In each of the above pas passages, it is the Father who acts through the Son. As we said a moment ago, the Son never acts through the Father, according to what we read in the Bible. In two very clear New Testament passages, we read of Christ's submission to His Father in the context of the future kingdom of glory, not only during His sojourn on earth. Remember when the mother of James and John asked Jesus if her two sons could sit at His right and had his left, on His left in the future kingdom of heaven. I've often wondered which one wanted to be on the right. The Bible doesn't tell us. <laughs> but remember what Jesus said in Matthew, the 23rd, 20th chapter, verse 23? 
to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. And the Apostle Paul declares in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 28, And when all things shall be subdued unto Him, that is Christ, then shall the Son also Himself be subject unto Him that put all things under Him, that God may be all and in all. At the onset of Lucifer's rebellion in heaven. Listen to what Ellen White says in volume 2 of the Spirit of Prophecy volumes, page 9. The Son of God was next in authority to the great lawgiver. In another statement, this one from uh, volume 5 of the Bible Commentary, page 1114, at His incarnation, He, that is Christ, gained in a new sense the title of the Son of God. This obviously means that he had previously been the Son of God in an older sense. Brothers and sisters, hear me out. This is why the ordination controversy is so important. This is the reason why the related controversy over human sexuality is so important. Because the image of God in humanity involves both men and women fulfilling the roles God gave them at the creation. That's why the book of Genesis says in chapter 1 verse 27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Remember what we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. The Apostle Paul writes elsewhere along these same lines. In Ephesians chapter 3, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And some men like to stop there. <laughs> but look what the next verse says. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Folks, there is no room for abuse in a relationship like that. Now, there are those who think this just applies to the home and not to the church. Well, listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. And by the way, that doesn't mean shut up. If you read in that same chapter, it speaks about living a life of quiet, quietness with regard to civil authorities. That doesn't mean you don't say anything. It means yielding and submission. That's what silence means in this verse. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. In other words, this order of authority goes back to a sinless world. We put all these texts together, folks, it becomes clear that a key component of the image of God as revealed in humanity is the blending of complementary male and female roles through headship and submission as God has designated. Th this is why the ordination controversy matters. People come to me all the time and they say, why is this issue so important? We're finding out why here this morning. Because the revelation of the image of God in humanity is at stake. That's the reason why homosexuality is unacceptable to God. It's not wrong because it's a no-no. It's not wrong because the great big God says don't do it and doesn't give us a reason. It's because two men in ultimate intimacy cannot reflect the image of God. Two women in ultimate intimacy cannot reflect the image of God. But, listen carefully, but simply because the inspired pen identifies different roles performed by the different members of the Godhead doesn't mean all three of them do not possess the same eternal pre-existence, coexistence, power, and wisdom. 
The issue of different roles within the Godhead is entirely separate from the issue of eternal pre-existence and co-existence. Don't let anybody tell you that if you oppose women's ordination, you're going to become a non-Trinitarian. That's not true. This issue of different roles involves God's image in humanity, but it doesn't have anything to do with God not being three persons in eternal coexistence and preexistence. Finally, the claim is being put forward that the Father, not the Son, is the sovereign of the universe. Well, if this is true, folks, why does the book of Revelation refer to Him as King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Is that the Father being described there? That's Jesus. Listen to what Ellen White says in confirming this reality. In volume 21 of the manuscript releases pages 64 and 65. Thus it will be with every class who choose to refuse the light God gives and persist in following a course of action that makes void the law of Him who is supreme ruler over all kings, over all human powers that oppose themselves to the law of the supreme ruler of the universe and set themselves in array against the expressed will of the great I Am. And who, in fact, is the great I Am, according to the same author? Who is the I Am? Jesus Christ, who was in the pillar of cloud. Once again, just as we did last evening, we're going to review briefly why this issue is so important. You know, some people might not watch this entire series of sermons. They may only see one. And that's the reason why we are repeating these points of importance. Why is anti-Trinitarianism such a threat to the church? Number one, because as I hope we are demonstrating, the pronouncements of the inspired writings offer crystal clarity regarding the reality of three co-eternal persons within the Godhead. And for Seventh-day Adventists, the writings of inspiration must ever remain, as we established last night, our supreme authority. Point number two, because contrary to what many contemporary Christians, including some Adventists, believe, doctrinal truth is very much a salvation issue. We saw a number of passages last night. Let's review them again very quickly. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Folks, that's more than just John 3, 16. People don't think doctrine is salvational. Look, the Bible says, this is Jesus talking. Man shall live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That includes the beasts as well as the Beatitudes. That includes Daniel and Revelation. It includes God punishing the Canaanites. That includes the angel of the Lord slaying the Assyrian army. You know, I have people say, oh, God couldn't, gentle Jesus couldn't have been involved in that. According to Ellen White on page 700 of the Desire of Ages, it was Jesus himself who gave the command to slay Sennacherib's army. Let's go on. John 8, 31, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Folks, that one little verse establishes sanctification is part of our salvation, believing the truth is part of our salvation. Timothy 1 Timothy, here Paul is writing to his young protege, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Let's look at, look at point number three in this list of reasons why this controversy is important. Because only God in the highest sense could make the supreme sacrifice for sin and thus make our salvation possible. Listen once again. We've quoted this statement twice. We're going to quote it again. 
Volume 5 of the Bible Commentary, page 1136. Not one of the angels could become surety for the human race. Their life is God's. They could not surrender it. The angels all wear the yoke of obedience. They are the appointed messengers of Him who is the commander of all heaven. But Christ is equal with God, infinite and omnipotent. He could pay the ransom for man's freedom. He is the eternal self-existing Son on whom no yoke had come. And when God asked, Whom shall I send? He could reply, Here am I, send me. He could pledge himself to become man's surety, for he could say that which the highest angel could not say. I have power over my own life, power to lay it down, and power to take it up again. Listen to what she writes about who is responsible for our sanctification. Volume 7 of the Bible Commentary, page 908. Our sanctification is the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Number four, because no non-Trinitarian has yet offered a compelling case from either Scripture or the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy as to the doctrinal, spiritual, or moral advantage to be gained by departing from the worldwide Adventist consensus on this issue. Number five, because at a time when so many other challenges to the doctrinal and moral integrity of our Adventist faith are accelerating all around us, additional theological confusion and divisiveness is certainly not needed. The child of Bethlehem, whose first advent we recount at this time of year, forever has been and forever will be God in the highest sense. Once again, from the ancient prophet's pen, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Father in heaven, we want that everlasting life in our own hearts. We want that everlasting righteousness to possess our lives and direct our paths. May this be our experience as we review this grand and glorious truth. This is our prayer in Jesus' name.